the Sherburne Killington historians are delighted to, pres to present Howard Coffin and his program, Vermont Women and the Civil War. Woodstock TV is here recording so that you're aware. And if you would please turn off your phones. Thank you. This is a Vermont Humanities program, and it's through their Speakers Bureau program. It's supported in part by the National Endowment for Humanities. This is how we're able to afford Mr. Clark. The, the Vermont Humanities would appreciate your feedback. At the end of the program, we're encouraging you to look at some of our display items here. And there is a link for the online survey for how you felt about the program. If you are going to do that, just take one of the little links. After the program, we'll show you the prior diaries, which are from the Civil War, and all of our letters from the Moore Estabrook collection. These are not the originals. We have the originals, but we made some copies for you. And we made extra copies of the transcripts so that you can actually read them at your leisure. The Sherman Historians meet each second Saturday of the month here at the library at 10 o'clock, except for next month, because it's Mother's Day weekend. We're going to meet on the third Saturday, which is the 18th. Everyone is welcome. You're here, so you must have some interest in history. And uh, we'd love your help. We'd love your input, your ideas. You don't have to have a skill set to enjoy the meetings. Justin Lindholm, who is one of our members, is going to uh, briefly open the program for Mr. Coffin. Justin. I'm going to spend about 15 minutes uh, basically talking about the uh, history of the uh, Civil War from this town here. If I say Shelburne by mistake, uh, I'm a Menden person. I, it's Sherburne, I hope. Anyway, the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, over 600,000 Americans died. If you want to put that in perspective, World War II only about 150,000 plus died from the United States. It is our deadliest disaster we've ever gotten into, except for diseases and whatever. I grew up as a Vermonter, but I had to spend time in school, junior high and high school, down in Charlestown, West Virginia. That was a hotbed of the Civil War. And while I was down there as a kid, everything was Civil War this and Civil War that. And they had a Civil War nasty little attitude down there, especially those of us with a northern accent. Charlestown is where they hang John Brown. I went to junior high and high school just a few yards from where they hanged him. We were surrounded by places like Harper's Ferry, which changed hands 14 times during the Civil War. Winchester, Virginia, also right there. That changed hands 70 times during the Civil War, about 70. They're not absolutely certain. And then the Battle of Antietam, me and my best friend would walk to it. That is the deadliest one-day battle in North America ever. It was deadlier than, Gettysburg was deadlier, but Gettysburg was a three-day battle. And we're going to get into Gettysburg just a second here. History in our school was the most important subject they could teach. It ranked higher than physics. A B in this one history class called Phase 5 counted the same as an A in physics. That's how important history is. I wish they would teach more of this type of history. History is the study of human nature when it's done properly. Human nature never changes. When you study history properly, it is a study of the past which helps us better understand the present and better predict the future. That's when you've learned it properly. It was a fascinating subject, the way they taught it. 
dates, times, names, places didn't mean as much as the human nature part. There were only a few of us enrolled in this class. And I'll tell you, we were wide awake during the whole thing. And uh, out of 65 classes, only one was that phase five history of taught every day in that school. That's how serious it was down there. Now in Sherburne, we had, at first I tried to do some research here and I couldn't find much because I thought they all went with the second Vermont where my great great grandfather was second Vermont down in Plymouth. But no, most of them were other different regiments. And they got into some really good battles down there. It, at the time of the Civil War, the start of the Civil War, a little over 500 people lived in this town. Mostly sheep farming. You couldn't do too much of the regular agriculture. Uh, it was all steep, steep areas everywhere, mostly, except right in the flats here. And the most of this flats is pretty well swampy. Lumbering was big. Um, Sherburne was a pretty laid back town. Uh, it's not like it is nowadays. 70 Sherburne people enrolled in the Civil War from this town. And 17 never returned. The Vermonters overall were in the heat of battle so much that I do believe Vermont overall in the Civil War lost more men per capita than any other northern state. There were some southern states that lost more per capita, but Vermont was right up there. We were at the front of battles all the time, the Vermonters. And um, when I introduce Howard Coffin, he's written four books on Vermonters in the Civil War. And you will see the theme of all of these is the Vermonters are right out front. They, um, they didn't run. Anybody that could build their own stone walls instead of having slaves do it must have been, um, had a good attitude for hard work and sacrifice. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about three different battles. Marie's Heights, I'm familiar with that because my great-great-grandfather was in Marie's, Marie's Heights from Plymouth. Uh, he was left for dead there. Marie's Heights, the first time we fought to try to take that, we lost 3,000 men in one hour trying to get up. This is in Fredericksburg. We tried to get up on these heights where the Confederates had their gun emplacements. And they just mowed us down. We tried charge after charge, and we could not do it. Um, we had 19,000 casualties during this first time we tried to get up on Marie's Heights. Now, this gives you something to think about for the second battle of Marine's, Marie's Heights. This is where some Sherburne people were in. I've seen at least four of them listed from the 6th Vermont. The second battle was less than five months later. We tried it again. This time we did it. And the 6th Vermont was right out front. They were right there to take those heights. My great-great-grandfather was also, from the 2nd Vermont, was right beside the 6th Vermont going up the, the hill. And he got shot and left for dead on the battlefield, but he recovered. But he was from Plymouth in the 2nd uh, Vermont a tremendously tough battle with a lot of dead people, but the second time we took it. Now, Battle of Cedar Creek, you go up there at the State House, you'll see this massive painting. And um, I think James Hope painted that. It is such a big painting, they couldn't find a canvas big enough in this country, from any mill in this country. They had to import the canvas from Europe. I don't know, it's 20 some feet long and over 10 feet and some high and it's the Battle of Cedar Creek. That is below where I went to school, uh, below Winchester, Virginia. Um, we had a tremendous battle that involved the 8th Vermont, and there were several people from Sherburne were in the 8th Vermont. Ezekiel West, he lived over up Wolf Hill, at the top of Wolf Hill over here. He was in that 8th Vermont regiment. They lost during this battle, 100, uh, out of 164 men in his regiment, they lost 110 killed or wounded, 
including 13 of the 16 officers. What they did, in fact, you go down to that battle site, it's an extensive battle drawn out over a lot of agricultural fields down there right now. They talk about the 8th Vermont down there. They stood there and stopped the Confederate charge, and then they were required to retreat after they lost a lot of their men. And then they turned around and drove the Confederates back. And the Union won that battle. That's how they took so many losses. They were tough people. Now, the last one I'm going to talk about, they were in a lot of different battles, uh, even the men from, from um, Sherburne here. Gettysburg, the 14th Vermont. There were a lot of people from Sherburne in the 14th Vermont Regiment. Gettysburg, I don't know if a lot of you have been down there. I lived right near it. I, it was an easy drive from where I lived, uh, grew up down there, to get to Gettysburg. You're going to see it's a north-south ridge, cemetery ridge. The Confederate Pickett's men were across a road over to the west. They charged across an open field to take that ridge and cut the Union in half below Gettysburg. You're going to see, if you go down there, you'll see where the unions, Union people were all lined up, huge monuments, these big states on the Union side built their monuments. And you look for, where was the Vermonters? Well, the 14th Vermont, the 16th Vermont, and the 13th Vermont were in front of the Union lines toward the Confederates that were charging across the field. They formed a V, almost a V, with the 16th Vermont shooting into the Confederates as they came by, shooting into the side of them. And the um, 14th Vermont, which is where a lot of the Sherburne guys were in, they were shooting to keep the 16th protected. So they made a, almost like a spear point, and the 13th was besides them. Now, William Doubleday, one of your residents back then, he lived up on top of Doubleday Hill. There was a farm up there. And that must have been a rough farm, because anything up on top of these hills is pretty, you know, the climate is just ugly, even compared to down here. And he was in that 14th Vermont, and he got wounded. Now, before the 14th Vermont got to Gettysburg, they were marching 120 miles in six days they wore wool uniforms. This is in the southern heat of July. They got to that battle, and some of the 14th Vermont had to drop out. They, could, they were just, they couldn't walk anymore. They weren't in the battle. William Doubleday was. He wasn't a young fellow either. But he had a premonition before this battle, and his premonition, he, he didn't like the dream he had. He had a dream one night. The next, he wrote to his wife a lot. I don't know, every couple of weeks he wrote a letter to her. He had four boys and his wife. He wrote, after this premonition where he had this bad dream, he said, the last bottom of his letter, he said, kiss the boys for me from Willie on down to little Fred. And that's how he ended that letter. He hadn't got to Gettysburg yet. And then he got wounded up there, stopping Pickett's charge. It's pretty heart-rending. He spent weeks trying to recuperate, got infected, and he was dying. He wrote to his wife at the bottom of his last letter, kiss the boys for me. That's pretty tough. What was written about the 13th, 14th, and 16th Vermont, the 14th was this town, by one of the generals who was just south of that spot that the Vermonters stood. You got to go out in front to find this spot, in front of the Union lines. It took me a while. I was thinking, well, I know the Vermonters were supposed to be here. Where were they? Right out in front. This general, who had seen what the Vermonters did, said, this is, quote, you asked me what I think of the valor of the Vermont troops on that occasion. 
I can only say that they performed perhaps the most brilliant feat during the war, for they broke the desperate charge of Pickett, saved the day, and with it, the whole North from invasion and devastation. That is considered the high tide of the Civil War, right where the Vermonters were. That's pretty neat that the Vermonters are that tough. And um, after the Civil War, we went through a period of 25 years of mourning. Built monuments everywhere, not just monuments to the Civil War. They put one up on top of Bird's Eye Mountain. It wasn't until about 1890, 25 years after, that we finally were getting over the mourning period because we had people come back from the war, millions of soldiers who were suffering from post-traumatic stress. They were beating their wives while they were drunk. They were trying to get over their mental pain, and they had physical pain. A lot of them were crippled for life. They were farm guys. They couldn't farm. You lose the leg. You lose the arm. Uh, arms and legs were taken off. Uh, they didn't have antibiotics, so in order to get things, keep them from being infected, they just cut off the arm, cut off the leg. Even then, you'd still get infected and die um, or have grievous injuries for life. My great-great-grandfather ended up with, um, after he rescued himself off the battlefield, um, he uh, lost 14 teeth, part of his tongue, part of his jaw. For the rest of his life, he had a hard time eating. He had a hard time talking. Uh, this stuff was all over the place. And um, anyway, now, that's my piece on the Civil War. I'm going to introduce you to Howard Coffin. I've known about Howard for a long time. I've bought, I think, every one of his books. Um, he says he's only written four on the Civil War. I swear he's, he's written more than that, because <laughs> you read about Howard all the time. And uh, anyway, he's, uh, he's really good. He, he makes me look stupid on the Civil War, and I thought I'd do something, but I really don't, <laughs> not compared to him. So Howard is going to talk about women in the Civil War. And that's very important, because I've read about a lot of this, but you don't see it in print much. They were right there in many different ways. And it's going to be fascinating to hear Howard talk. Uh, I'm going to take this coat off, because i got a lot of work to do. Uh, before I do that, I've had four people ask me about these. And I'll quickly explain. Uh, this flag up here has been with me for, I spoke at Gettysburg at the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg. And they, this is one of the things they gave me for that, and I love it. That was a, a big speech, and there were millions on C-SPAN listening to me, which made me a little nervous. I don't usually get nervous. but And this one is, uh, when I was in the Army, I served in the 2nd Armored Division, which has now been discontinued. It was one of the great World War II divisions. A Vermonter commanded it, Ernest Harmon. And I was in the Civil War, in the, uh, almost in the Civil War, but in the Second Armored for two years. And there's an association been formed. And they called me recently and said, will you wear one of these pins if they send it to you? So I agreed to, to try to keep the name alive. And it's Hell on Wheels. Name of the division was when the, the first weekend I was at Fort Hood, Texas, when I joined that outfit, I went to the museum. And there were paintings of the two most famous members of the Second Armored Division at the entrance to the museum. They were of equal size and they were huge. There was George Patton with his two pearl handled revolvers, you know. And you know who was beside him with an equal place of importance? Elvis Presley. <laughs> Elvis Presley. After he left the Army, he gave Fort Hood a million dollars to build an enlisted men's club. It was a wonderful gift, and that was when a million dollars was a million dollars. A beautiful facility, yes. All right, but that's not the job I've got to do today. I'm going to try to talk without a microphone. Usually people can hear me, I think. But if my voice begins to fade, you let me know. By the way, I, this is home territory for me. I grew up in Woodstock. I went to the cemetery down here before I came here to visit the graves of my aunt and uncle. 
Julia and Gail Merriam. They worked in the woolen mill in Bridgewater. Spent, I spent a lot of time with them and I had so much fun. When Gail died, probably 30 years ago, I was one of the bearers. And I'll never forget it. Uh, they had so many friends. And so I rode in the hearse coming from the, set of the church in Bridgewater up here to bury him. And uh, they stopped the hearse uh, when we got to Sherburn up here where you turn. And he stopped the hearse to make sure we were out ahead of a little everybody, a little bit of everybody. And the funeral director wanted to make sure that everybody turned right, you know, so we get to the... And so we stopped and I got out of the hearse and I looked down that valley. And it was like, you know, Queen, Queen Elizabeth was followed by all those horses and guards and everything, you know, and um, the coaches that were coming along. The, what I saw was better. There wasn't a new car in that procession of cars coming up that valley. There must have been more than a hundred of them. These rattle traps were coming along, friends of, a, of that dear man. Uh, it, it was wonderful. We buried him down here and uh, there he rests. I had so much fun with him. He did, he was an amazing man. He was a dowser and he could draw a breath of cigarette smoke into his mouth and then he'd swell up his cheeks and his face would get contorted and then the smoke would come out his ears. <laughs> amazing man. That's not the topic. By the way, one, one addition to what you said, uh, it has long been thought that 520,000 men died in the Civil War. New research now puts the total somewhere around at least 770,000, and it's going up because it's been found particularly that the Confederates concealed many of their casualties, and they're coming to light now. It's a much bloodier war than we thought it was. Horrible. At 8 a.m., December 6, 1859, with a gleaming new coating of snow down on the Champlain Valley, the Rutland train arrived at the Virgins Station, bearing a famous widow with the even more famous body of her husband. Mary Day Brown stepped off and waited while workers placed the casket bearing John Brown's body in a waiting wagon. Brown the abolitionist had been hanged four days prior by the Commonwealth of Virginia for attempting to start a slave rebellion by capturing the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Mary Day, who had grown up along the Vermont border in Granville, New York, had married the widower Brown and bore him 14 of his 20 children. Yeah. And she had worked tirelessly with her husband in his abolitionist activities. Now she was taking him home for burial on their farm in the Adirondacks. There she would continue to work, continue to work for human freedom as the great war John Brown's act had made inevitable came to pass. Incidentally, their farm is at Lake Placid, just outside Lake Placid. It's a wonderful museum. You can see it today. That war had been a long time coming in Vermont, where the slavery issue had burned bright since before Vermont became a republic and adopted the hemisphere's first constitution that outlawed slavery. Partly as a consequence, almost a half century later, on May 1st, 1834, the Vermont Anti-Slavery Society was founded as an adjunct of the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society. And Garrison, also a strong advocate of women's rights, had broken precedent by allowing female membership in his society and state organizations affiliated with it. Soon there were 90 local chapters of the Anti-Slavery Society in Vermont. Many Vermont women joined 
After all, they knew something about slave wages. In Norwich in 1843, local women formed a female anti-slavery society stating in its constitution that, quote, slavery as it exists in this nation is a direct violation of the law of God. Vermont women now had a chance to involve themselves in a political movement. They really weren't allowed to before then. In the mountain town of Plymouth, the most famous resident before you know who, Calvin Coolidge, was the spiritualist Axa Sprague. Well before the war began, she traveled throughout the East holding seances and lecturing. Oh, yes, uh, she could contact, she said, the dead. In addition to contacting spirits, she also always spoke at her performances, which drew crowds of two and three thousand people. She spoke against the great crime of American slavery. Sadly, she died in 1862, Two did not live to see the end of the Civil War. Probably the powerhouse of all Vermont's anti-slavery women was Clarina Howard. Born in West Townsend near Brattleboro, she married a Baptist minister and moved to upstate New York. He was considerably older than she was and she divorced him, which was not common in those days, in 1840 and returned back to Brattleboro. Then she married George Nichols, publisher of Brattleboro's Wyndham County Democrat. When her husband became ill, she ran the paper and continued his anti-slavery editorials and editorializing for women's rights. In 1852, Clarina became the first woman to speak to the all-male Vermont legislature, urging passage of a bill allowing women to vote in school district meetings. Most legislators stomped and jeered throughout her hour-long speech. She kept going. The next year, she took her family to Kansas to join the bloody anti-slavery fight. Bloody Kansas, they called it. She published an anti-slavery paper while Quantrill's raiders roamed the countryside. Her son, Relly fought with John Brown in Kansas. After the war began, Clarina came east to Washington and ran an orphanage for the children of escaped slaves. Among her friends were Mary Todd Lincoln and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the great suffragette. Before the Civil War began, Vermonters had gotten a look at Southerners every summer. They came here to the Mineral Springs towns, Brattleboro, Woodstock, Clarendon Springs, many more, to get away from the Southern heat and take the waters, as it was said. One local woman in Clarendon Springs wrote, Of the Southern clientele, a few dowager ladies, an occasional woman with a few children and a smattering of dashing young men who rode well, played cards, and danced well. But by far the largest percentage were charming, affected young women with a trunk full of beautiful clothes and, as far as the natives could see, a head full of butterflies, giggles, incomprehensible chatter, and nonsense. They might have a maiden aunt in tow and always a mammy or maid to supervise everything. Slaves, you see, were running the show. In Peacham, the Johnsons were a family of abolitionists. Oliver worked for William Lloyd Garrison in Boston. Sisters Martha and Carolyn went to North Carolina and teached freed slaves after the war began. Martha died there. From Pittsford, Samantha Kelly took herself to Alabama to teach. 
She wrote in her diary there in 1856, Oh, how miserable warm this day in this room is. Finished reading Uncle Tom for the second time this morning. Many of the expressions that were new and strange when I read it are now strangely familiar. Oh, slavery. And I, a New Englander, and Lim living in the middle of it. She taught Uncle Tom in Alabama before the Civil War. Talk about bravery. My God. It was outlawed. Abolitionists spoke all over Vermont. Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips. In West Hartford, Mary Frances Elkins spoke at the Congregational Church, which still stands. An orphaned black woman, she came to Boston before the war and got involved in the abolition movement. When John Brown was in prison, awaiting execution after his raid on Harper's Ferry, 1859, she had written to him, your martyr grave will be a sacred altar upon which men will record their vows of undying hatred to that system which tramples on men and bids defiance to God. Brown was hanged on December 2nd. Two weeks later, five of his supporters were also hanged. Miss Elkins wrote to one of those men just before he died, and a scrap of, of some of her writing was found in his cell after his death, part of a poem called Bury Me in a Free Land. Here's just one stanza. Make me a grave where'er you will, in a lovely place or a lofty hill. Make it among the humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. On the envelope in which that poem was found was the word Montpelier. We believe she sent that poem from Montpelier, Vermont. I should mention that in Danville, Sally Stevens was deserted by her husband early in their marriage, about 1814, when he ran off to enlist for the War of 1812 and never came home. So she had four boys to raise, and she made a living by taking care of the sick and dying around Danville. And she often took her crippled son, Thaddeus, with her. He had a club foot. And he helped taking care of people. Thaddeus grew up to go to Dartmouth, to go to Pennsylvania and open a law office in Gettysburg. And he finally got elected to Congress and became the most powerful single congressman during the Civil War the man most responsible for the Union war effort in Congress is Thaddeus Stevens, one of the truly great Vermonters. And he often came back to Vermont to visit his mother, built her a big house that still stands in Danville. So the war came with the election of Lincoln as president. War fever, fever settled on Vermont. Vermont women immediately got involved certainly early on, catching the spirit. War meetings were held throughout the state to encourage enlistments. In Brookfield, the United Church, a local newspaper, said, every time a man rose to enlist, the house broke forth in applause and cheering. Then the governor began to make all manner of inducements to get the men to enlist. He even offered to give any man who would enlist his choice of the girls in the church to kiss. Not sure he'd have gotten away with that today. In Guilford, a notice advertising a war meeting at the outset began with the words, Women Invited. That was rare to public meetings. At least it was before the Civil War. May 15, 1861 in Bristol. A war meeting began with a procession led by 25 ladies carrying the national standard. The national standard, the flag. In Lindenville, June 14, 1861, the Caledonian record said, Women of this village met at the town hall yesterday in large numbers. Wrong 
did I hear ghosts? <laughs> it was an unusual sight, that of 75 ladies and 11 sewing machines in that large hall making shirts, sick gowns, sheets, pillowcases. And the men began going to war. From Stowe, farm wife Olive Cheney wrote to her daughter in New Hampshire. She wrote throughout the war to this daughter. <laughs> I felt like a ventriloquist. <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. No problem. No problem. <laughs> speaks out of turn, we bring him out there. I spoke in Groton two years ago and a young man jumped up and screamed and turned all the lights out. That was strange. <laughs> oh, we got them back on. Olive Cheney, she wrote to her daughter throughout the war, daughter in New Hampshire, and those letters, thank God, are saved. The women like Olive, of course, weren't going to war. They weren't so caught up in the war hysteria after things settled down a little. Here's a letter she wrote to her daughter. Last Monday, her father took Edwin to the center. War's just beginning. Ed enlisted in war. To war he must go and said he should go. It seems pretty hard for your father to give him up as he has made so much calculation for him to stay at home. It is strange what makes the boys want to go to war. If the boys hated to go as bad as we hated to have them, there could not be much fighting done now, could there? See, there's a different tone to so many of these women's letters. All four of her boys went to war and came home safely. Jane Ackerman Gray of Bristol, New Hampshire, saw her husband enlist without telling him she then put her four sons and three daughters in a buckboard and headed north toward Canada. She reached Canaan, Vermont, and bought a house, thinking she had crossed the border into Canada. She had not. She had bought a house in the United States. She wanted to go to Canada so her boys could not be drafted. When she found out her awful mistake, she sold the house she bought moved a mile north, bought a house in Canada, stayed four years, waited till the war ended, went back to New Hampshire, met her husband, and continued with life. <laughs> Brattleboro, maybe the most important Civil War town, site of the big war camp. This poem appeared on the front page of the Brattleboro Reformer, written by a teenager from Brattleboro, Mary Tyler. This is what she wrote when the 4th Vermont Regiment marched from their camp to the train to take them south to war. Watch for that tone. Slowly through the misty street comes the measured tramp of feet, and a thousand forms sweep by going forth to win or die. Stepping to the roll of drum, down the darkening street they come, ready each to bear his part, to resign it may be life, eager but to join the strife. Will they tread the homeward track? Lord, in mercy, bring them back. Mary Estes, Mary Tyler, who later became Mary Estes, the organ family, was a child when the war began. Late in life, she gave a series of lectures on Brattleboro history. Brattleboro is, as I said, the site of, of one of three military hospitals in Vermont, uh, the others at uh, Montpelier and Burlington, and the biggest camp. She wrote, it was a great relief to the people of Brattleboro, whose homes were on Canal and Main Streets. For before the hospital was built, nearly every house had a sick soldier in it. The games of children on the streets during those years partook of the war spirit. Amputating arms and legs, carrying each other on stretchers was common. I think she didn't mean that literally. 
uh, nationwide two organized organizations formed with chapters throughout the North to help support the war effort, the Sanitary Commission and the Christian Commission. Vermont women in many towns fast formed groups to make things for the soldiers and affiliated with one of those two organizations. In Waitsfield, the town history says the society was organized auxiliary to the Christian Commission and many army supplies prepared by hands of devoted women that met regularly in the hall of the brick tavern in the village were shipped directly to the front uh, box on box of supplies. In Vernon in 1858, the Vernon Women's Home Missionary Society began meeting in a farmhouse on Houghton Hill. Through the war, they met to make things for the war effort. Remarkably, that society still exists and still meets in that same house. Bridgeport Ladies Sewing Circle met at the Congregational Church. Most of the groups met in churches. In Woodstock, Mary Colomer, wife of U.S. Senator Jacob Colomer, a real power in the Senate, organized relief efforts and met in her home. In Barnett, two houses from the Congregational Church, lived Miss Laura Moore. The town history states that she worked tirelessly providing items for the soldiers. That history also says that in each village in the town, women made warm garments for the men in the field and delicacies for the sick and wounded. And women drove from farm to farm collecting articles as could be spared, which were sent to the front. In Derby Line, Elizabeth, wife of Congressman Portis Baxter, went door to door. When in Washington, she and her husband both volunteered in the military hospitals as nurses. Good people. And the war meetings went on. July 7, 1862, Lucy Ann Rose wrote from her family farm in Addison over in the Champlain Valley. Last Friday, the 4th, we had a Snake Mountain excursion. Estimated 2,000 people there, cannons firing. A recruiting officer was trying to get volunteers. Cousin Marvin Clark says he would like to go, but Aunt Harriet and her parents are trying to stop it. Marvin Clark snuck away from Addison and enlisted in the 13th Vermont and was blown to smithereens by an artillery shell at Gettysburg. In Vermont at the time of the Civil War, there existed, imagine this, more than 30,000 farms. What do we have now? Less than 500? Yeah. 30,000 farms. Most of them were around when we were kids, right? 30,000, most small hill farms. Their life was ever a challenge. From early morning milking, the work day went on to the barn, the fields, on into the night. One of the reasons for large families was the help that children could give to mother and father. But now the able-bodied sons and fathers were leaving. There were 315,000 people in Vermont in 1860, half of what we have today. Nearly 35,000 would serve. The great home front dramas were played out on the hill farms. So much of the burdens fell on the women some families could afford a, hire, a hired man, but not many. And if there was one available, he probably had some deformity, something that kept him out of the service. It was tough. Early in the war, Hiram Spencer wrote his wife Angelina in Newark up in the Northeast Kingdom. Be as careful as you can and get along as easy as you can till I get home and then I will try to help you so that you won't have to work so hard. I should like to come home, but I can't as things are now and I have got to work for Uncle Sam. There's a tone in that too that I don't quite like. Anyway, letters from the home front are rare. The soldiers would get a letter from home, they're carrying 40 or 50 pounds on their back. 
they would read most of the home front letters and tear them up. They didn't want anything else to carry. So they're harder to find today. Soldier letters by the thousands are here. In orange, Royal Flanders left his wife Hannah and six young sons in a mountain, far a mountain farmhouse in orange Vermont and enlisted. It wasn't a farmhouse, it was a cabin. Six sons. This was in the 18, early 1862. He didn't come home on leave until 1863 for two weeks in the fall, and when he left, she was pregnant. She soon wrote to him that she was destitute. I want money very bad for the children are perfectly shirtless. She sent two boys to work in a, in a mine. They were under 14 years of age. He did not come home until the war ended. He stayed at home for one month, and when he left, it turned out she's pregnant again. He went to Brattleboro to work in the military hospital to take care of the sick soldiers. He came home in six months with a case of chronic diarrhea and died. S soon Hannah was placed in an insane asylum where she stayed two years, but she recovered, came back to Orange, rounded up her children, and raised them all as a family, and they all turned out well. It's a remarkable story, and it, 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 it's like post-traumatic stress syndrome on a woman. In Craftsbury, John Paddleford left wife Carolyn to run the farm. She wrote him. It has been frozen most of the time, though it is thawing today. I am quite alone today, expecting grandmother and baby and Jenny. Oh, how I wish you was by my side. She went on to talk about the high price of oats, the good work of the hired man, and how she had just purchased a brand new horse she named Abraham Lincoln. Sergeant, Sergeant R. Dutton Silsby. Company B, 13th Vermont, and his wife Amanda Brown were farmers in Moortown. They had seven children. Now this is a farm that could afford a hired man, but still a tough go. She writes, he writes every day early on when he goes in the army in 62. He doesn't get a letter from her for six weeks. Who's busier? And he, he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. He asks why she's not writing. Here's one of the letters. I need some gloves, dear. If you have time to knit them. If you don't, you'd better send me some good lined buckskin ones. There. After week, she writes, we have engaged Oscar Bailey. He will work for $18 for one month and then work for his board during the winter. November 12th it is now past 10 o'clock. Everything is still and the girls finally are quiet. Than I can think. I hardly had time this evening, for Oscar is so rattle-headed that in spite of all my sober feelings, he will keep me laughing, and I hardly know which I am the most provoked at, him for being so nonsensical, or at myself for being so foolish as to laugh at him. But you know my weaknesses. But I assure you that though I laugh ever so much, it does not drive you from my thoughts. November 14th. Now this, here she analyzes the military situation, and she hits it right on the head. I mean, she's, this, is, this is good stuff. November 14, 1862. I suppose before this you have heard of General McClellan's removal from office. There seems to be more dissatisfaction with the management of affairs than I have ever seen before. The 600,000 men that were going to end this war in double quick time going into winter quarters without striking a blow. I tell you, Dutton, when you left home, I thought it a mind accomplish some good. <laughs> and she adds, I'm so busy on, a, on account of butchering. 
Yesterday, I let the girls go to school uh, for the first time in three weeks, and perhaps I could, they can go tomorrow. Whoa. Three military hospitals were opened in Vermont, as I mentioned, as the casualties increased. Montpelier, Brattleboro, and, and Burlington. In Montpelier, the Vermont Watchman, we are soon to have among us the brave boys who have been disabled by wounds and disease. We shall be in want of sheets, pillowcases, blankets, pillows, comforters. Send to hospital or to Surgeon William B. Casey at the pavilion. We will need them for at least 1,500 men. Jesus. Two weeks later, Surgeon Casey writes a letter to the local paper. On behalf of the sick and wounded in this hospital, sincere thanks to the residents of this and neighboring towns, particularly the women. We have everything we need in two weeks for 1,500 patients. Amazing. Some women, mostly officers' wives, went with their husbands to war. Mary Farnham, wife of Roswell Farnham from Bradford, he was second in command of the 12th Vermont Regiment. The regiment went into winter camp in northern Virginia at Fairfax Courthouse. Mary Farnham was a pistol. She was something. He invited her to come and join him in camp. Officers could do that. It took her three weeks to get from Bradford to northern Virginia. You can do it by train in two days easily. But she went to Boston to visit France. She was partying, and she had a hell of a good time. He finally, she finally got down there, and he was furious. It took her so long. The first night that she's in camp there, this is with the 2nd Vermont Brigade, five regiments down there. You're talking 2,500 men. Here's what she wrote the first morning she was in camp. When I opened my cabin door, such a splendid scene I never before beheld. Twenty fires were burning, 600 or more men hurrying about. Beyond glowed the blood-red tint of morning. She knew what was coming. Those guys were headed to fighting. They were headed for Gettysburg. This is the second Vermont Brigade that will break Pickett's charge. I was thinking about last night about this talk and my mind settled as it did when I wrote the book on Gettysburg as, as you mentioned on William Doubleday up on Doubleday Hill up, up there and his four kids and his wife that he left, a Zenith with his wife's name. And he didn't, he enlisted in 1862 in the, in the second Vermont Brigade. And they came down that hill in the buckboard and he went down to Rutland and, and joined up there and went from Rutland to Brattleboro to, to war. And of course he was horribly wounded during Pickett's charge and in the arm and he had to, they finally had to amputate the arm and he died. He wrote several letters home when he was trying to survive. He was lonesome. He was homesick. He was sad. And I thought last, I thought last night, you know, the 2nd Vermont Brigade was formed there in, in the late summer and early fall of 62, and it, and it would win the Battle of Gettysburg, basically. That's what this book is about. And I thought... I was thinking last night of Doubleday and his kids and his wife coming down in that buckboard, down that steep hill, in money, of course. It was probably a rickety old thing. The horse was probably scrawny. But all over Vermont, farm men and their families were coming down the hill in the buckboard to enlist. And I thought, Wouldn't it, couldn't you make a film of that? showing the, the double days coming down and with Yo-Yo Ma all alone on, on a cello playing slowly Battle Hymn of the Republic. 
and then you raise your camera up and you see this happening all over the state, these individual people coming to go to war, and it becomes a flood, hundreds and thousands of them. And then the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sings, <laughs> Battle Hymn of the Republic. My God, you know, that's what it was. These single soldiers leaving home, probably in tears, simply to win the Civil War here in Vermont. No state per capita did more. In East Montpelier, Hannah Pitkin, a farm wife, wrote this. One of the great statements on the war's agony. In the vigor of young manhood, they went one and another, who were household treasures. Perhaps household treasures. God. Perhaps the last news was seen on the battlefield or taken prisoner, and then the long months elapsed. At last came the fearful, died at Andersonville. God. Whoa. Well, perhaps the best known Vermont woman connected to the Civil War was a teenage beauty, black haired beauty, from Georgia, Vermont, named Ellen Elizabeth Joy. <clears throat> Talk about pistols, she was one. She was a small and beautiful lady, and she ran away from home when she was about 15 to join the circus, and she became, became a trick rider. She, she had talents to be a, an equestrian, and she traveled with the circus for a while, and when the war began, she went to Washington to see if she could help in some way, and there she met her true love, a noble man from Europe named Princess, Prince Sam Sam, S-A-L-M, S-A-L-M, Prince Sam Sam. His full name was Constantine Alexander Johann Nepomuk Prince Sam Sam. And they got married, and he gave her a huge white stallion. And she rode that all over Washington, and she became famous, this beautiful young lady on this incredible horse. And she began working in the hospitals to help the soldiers. And the whole town came to know her as Princess Samson. And they became friends of Abraham Lincoln and went to the White House and had dinner several times, although Mary Lincoln hated her. Mary Lincoln was the most jealous person that ever walked the earth, I think. And if a good-looking woman came near Abraham, she just threw fits. And Lady Samson was probably the best-looking woman in Washington. Uh, and then when her husband went to war in the, with the Union Army, she went with him and worked as a doctor's assistant in surgeries. At the end of the Civil War, they both survived. They went to Texas and joined the Mexican War and he was killed there. She went to Europe to try to get, to find some of his fortune, and died there in poverty. But she was the famous Princess Samson. Mary Winchester, a Middlebury farm girl, in 1858 married Warren Winchester, pastor of the Bridport Congregational Church. He became an army chaplain assigned to a hospital in Washington. Soon he sent for Mary and their three girls and a boy. They were singers. And soon after they got to Washington, they went to his hospital and gave a concert. Two days after the concert, which the soldiers loved, all the kids came down with sore throats. Diphtheria. The three girls died within a week. The boy barely survived. They stayed in Washington through the war, came back to Middlebury, and had 14 more kids. He went back to the Bridgeport Church. In Eden, in June 1862, George Emory enlisted in the 11th Vermont, left his wife Mary Bell and six children behind. 
She soon went to Washington to be with him. He was captured in battle and died at Andersonville. She and the children had nothing, but the commander of the regiment hired them and gave them two jobs, a total of two jobs as washerwomen. And they survived throughout the war and came back to Vermont. The Battle of Gettysburg was fought. In Brattleboro, the young woman Mary Fuller said, solicited in different parts of the village, a friend and I collected $100 in an hour on the backside of the brook for the victims of Gettysburg. A Chester historian said that the Chester Soldiers Aid Society in 1863 produced 17 sheets, 171 towels, 68 pounds of dried apples, 83 pairs of drawers, 49 cotton shirts, 18 quilts, 18 pairs of socks, 19 pillowcases, 20 pairs of slippers, rags, bandages, lint, and one pair of mittens. I think probably that pair of mittens were sharpshooter mittens. Probably there was a sharpshooter from town. And sharpshooter mittens had one finger separate from the rest of the hand so you could pull the triggers. A uh, an island pond, Susan, Susan Aldrich's husband, John, died in 1852, leaving her with five children, three enlisted. Soon a recruiting officer made his appearance and three of, the boy, all three of the boys went away to war, and all three died. Every night, twice a week, every night, every week, twice, Suzanne walked from her home three miles into Island Pond and worked five hours on making things for the soldiers and then walked back, a long walk in the snow, and during the war, she built her own house all by herself. It still stands. Beautiful place. Morristown Coders. Widow Gates lived near the hamlet of Morristown Coders with a son and a daughter on a very small farm. Her son William enlisted at 14 in the 5th Vermont Regiment as a fifer. In 1862, her daughter died. The widow went to Washington to see Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to get her son released from the Army. She needed him to run the farm. But Stanton wouldn't see her. So what did she do? She walked across the street to the White House. And Lincoln saw her. And she came home with William. That's Lincoln. People got by in Vermont by helping each other. In Waterville local paper, Miss H. Beard and Mrs. Curtis Beard, whose husbands have both gone to war, have harvested corn raised on their farm, invited ten women of the neighborhood and hussed out 40 bushels. West Fairley, Nancy Miles Kimball, operated a knitting business connected to a Boston company. They employed local women, some 40 of them, to knit. It was a way to make badly needed money. On connected farms along the Northfield Mountains in the Waitsfield area, women banded together to work 1,200 acres of land. They called themselves the Mountain Maids and their enterprise, the Floodworth Farms. In Peacham, Edward Palmer died of wounds at Wilderness. While he was at war, his wife and daughter lived in many homes, moving in with families to make clothes. Women dresses and men's suits. Wealthy families, you see. In June 1861, Dorothea Dix, D-I-X, a Massachusetts woman, once a crusader for mental health and prison reform, met in Washington with War Department officials who accepted her offer to recruit female nurses for hospitals around Washington. Some 9,000 women would serve as nurses, 300 under Dix's oversight. Many of the hospitals were staffed with nurses supervised by a super nurse named Mary Livermore, also of Massachusetts. Remember that name. 
quote, Dex established standards recruited, recruits had to be between 35 and 50, matronly in appearance, mm -hmm. and with habits of neatness, order, sobriety, and industry. Wages, $12 per month. Little attention paid to medical experience or training. She was flooded with applications from women throughout the North. Later in the war, as the numbers of wounded spilled out of the hospital, so many, the requirement about looks did not longer matter. <laughs> Amanda Coburn, a Glover farm girl, followed her brother, Henry, to war in the 3rd Vermont Regiment. She served throughout the war, assisting in operations, driving an ambulance, caring for wounded. When requested, she kept patient valuables in her tent. One night, a soldier tried to steal them, and she shot him. I don't know how he came out. Not only did the hospitals increase the demand for goods from the women, but the soldiers themselves were demanding of the people at home. Families sent boxes to, to the front, mostly filled with food, turkeys, chickens, you know, and all kinds of vegetables. And the railroad service was so good, they'd get there before the thing spoiled. Probably couldn't do that today. Private Jonathan Blaisdell, 11th Vermont, wrote to home in Cambridge, sent some dried apples, some, oh, excuse me, send some dried apples, butter and cheese, and I will send money as soon as I get some. And I want about 75 pounds of sugar, and I can sell it for 50 cents a pound, maple sugar. I want you should send a little can of molasses, a little bottle of camphor, a pair of boots, some horse radish, and some vinegar put in with it, and I will think of many more things that I will write tomorrow. You think they might be a little busy at home? Captain Edward Horton chittened and wrote this to home. I received the box I got today. The pies and the oysters was spoiled. The play had gone out of the oysters. The oyster juice had run into the pies, and they were all jammed up and moldy. Oh. Thanks for trying. No. <laughs> Still, by the way, Vermont soldiers were always asking to send maple sugar. They could sell that at incredible prices to the Confederates during the winter when they were facing each other across the Rappahannock River. They'd send little boats back and forth. The, the Southerners would send newspapers and tobacco, and, and the Vermonters would send this maple sugar that they'd never tasted, and they just thought it was something God made. You know? Well, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Still a demands for good increase. In Burlington, a report of the Ladies' Relief Association listed as having been made 84 haversacks, 164 shirts, 168 drawers, 185 towels, 30 sheets, and much more. My old friend, the historian in, ba in Burlington, T.D. Seymour Bassett, he's long gone and great friend, wrote, for the first time individualistic Vermonters were cooperating in a huge public collective enterprise, which proved its merit by helping win a great war. The immensity of the resources focused to this end, the complicated, extensive, and large-scale logistics, and the size of the labor force dwarfed all previous efforts. The people of Vermont had never been and never would be so unanimous about anything. I think he's right. Factories were busy as they, as they had ever been. Mills in Bridgewater, Woodstock, Winooski, Ludlow, many towns produced wool for the armies, blankets, and uniforms. Increasingly, the workforces were women. In Woodstock, women by 1865 were demanding higher wages and fewer hours from the mill owner Solomon Woodward. His daughter was alive when I was living in Woodstock. Her name was Minnie Garrison. I don't know if any of you local might remember that. But she lived to be 106, was it? Something like that. Uh, in Lunenburg, young Suba Thomas left work to work in the woolen mills in Lowell, Massachusetts. She came home six in 1865 and soon died. It was a rough life. The Boston Post, this sad story. In 1864, a young girl 
neatly though plainly dressed, was arrested by a police officer for improperly soliciting men upon the street. When taken to the station house, she admitted the charge, said she was compelled to adopt that course of life or starve. She came from Vermont with her mother and sister because they could find no employment there. The mills now were full. On the farms, the strain increased. Lucia Brown in Williston wrote in her diary in 1863, living by herself, ironed this forenoon and this afternoon went to the Ladies' Aid Society. I want to sew and do all I can for the poor soldiers. Lucia had married twice. Her first husband went off on the California gold rush and never came back. The second wouldn't stay home, so she finally threw him out. She also wrote, the more I see of men, the more I like dogs. <laughs> Hannah Glines' husband was a wagoner in the second Vermont. They're from Tunbridge, five kids. November 3rd, 1862, it rains and blows terribly. We have our wood to draw down from the woods. It seems as if we should all freeze to death. My wood is so poor. I have got no money yet. Only what I can borrow. I have worked so hard, I feel I am almost dead. And now the daughters are starting to cry. I wish Pa was here. The war came home in cruel ways. And Cabot Mary Lance was engaged to marry Captain Abel Morrill of the 3rd Vermont. He came on home on leave in the winter of 64, went back. The wilderness battle was fought and he was killed. When news came, a group of men from the town came out to her big farmhouse just outside of Cabot, still there, and told her that he had died. She thanked them for bringing the news, went back in and closed the door and never came outside again until they carried her out dead 50 years later. In Callis, Private Joel Robinson fought at Gettysburg survived, came home sick with typhus within two weeks. Four members of his family were dead of typhus. In Fairhaven, the ladies of Fairhaven are doing a noble work for our brave volunteers. Last Tuesday under their offices, a festival was held at the town hall. The contributions consisted of the Tableau V box of rare excellence. What were they? Well, the ladies would create on the stage of the town hall with the curtain closed. They would take people and dress them up and recreate a famous painting, Washington crossing the Delaware, okay? Here's Washington in his boat, you know, and he's got his men with his paddles and all that. And then they'd open the curtains, you know, and people for 10 minutes would see Washington crossing the Delaware, close the curtain, and then Whistler's mother would sit in her chair and open the curtain. They'd do about a dozen paintings a night, you know? It was the closest thing they had to movies. Very popular. Middlebury, 1862, the winter. In Leicester, they have not had a wedding in town all winter. Seems rather strange. The young men have all gone to war. In Brattleboro, Mary Estes recalled, the memory of those four awful years seems to those who live through them like a dreadful dream. And of last, at last, of course, the war did end. April 12, 65. End of war celebration in Middlebury. Loads of fair women and brave men in triumphal procession, which traversed the streets with banners flying. In Manchester, reservations made the previous summer for President Abraham Lincoln and family by First Lady Mary Lincoln to stay at the Equinox House were canceled, of course. John Wilkes Booth saw to that. In Montpelier, after several years, the former First Lady of the Confederacy came to spend the summer with a friend. People did not like her at all. I don't know whether anybody told her about the gallows that had been built on the State House lawn for her husband. Strafford, Janet Flanders, 15 when she married Alcott Bacon before the war. He died at New Bern Battle in 1863. She lived until 1933. 
but never remarried, saying that she never found a, wor a man that was worth my pension. She got $7 a month. 1866, as the war ended, the Woodstock women at the woolen mill went on strike. They marched downtown to Woodstock's best restaurant, had the most accented things on the menu, and charged the menu and lots of drinks to Solomon Woodward, the owner of the mill. They won better pay and shorter hours. Yes. Nathaniel Burbank of Walden, veteran of the Navy, not many Vermont naval veterans. Granddaughter Irene remembered, Grandpa was a dear old man. Grandma used to listen to his stories, but after a while told us kids, war wasn't as glorious as he made it sound. That tone. In Bradford, Callista Robinson Jones, in 1911, was elected national president of the Women's Relief Corps. Before election, she served on two of the Corps' Andersonville committees. She worked with Clara Barton to save Andersonville Prison, so it is now a national park. In Chelsea, Clara Searles Bixby lost her husband at Andersonville. She lived 50 more years, never remarried, had a cenotaph, erected in the Chelsea Cemetery, honoring her husband, who never, his body never came home. It said, God has marked every sorrowing day and numbered every secret tear. August 12, 1912, dedication of the Coventry Memorial. Beautiful memorial, still stands up there in the kingdom. Carvings of Grant, Lincoln, Dewey, and Stannard. The Newport Express said, teams and autos and pedestrians coming from all directions. 2,000 people were on the grounds. Josiah Grout was the speaker, former cavalryman, former governor. I wish here to express the hope that sometime, somewhere in the most prominent place for national observation, the gratitude of our people will take form in the shape of a monument of the most lofty and enduring character in honor of and to the memory of the women of Vermont in the Civil War, who at home, in the hospital, and on the field did so much in so many ways to encourage him who bore the brunt of the battle and to soften the severity of his privations and relieve suffering. In 1992, historian Tom Bassett concluded, Vermont women enlisted for the duration. Recently, a book has come out written by two historians at the National Archive in Washington called They Fought Like Demons, Women Soldiers in the Civil War. In that book, these historians say that two honeymooners Martin and Elizabeth Niles from Shaftesbury, Vermont, enlisted together on September 2nd, 1862 in the 14th Vermont Infantry and served for the 10 months the regiment served. Her maiden name, incidentally, the Elizabeth Niles was Hauser, H-A-U-S-E-R. There is no reason to doubt their careful research. And if, if it be true as it likely is, Martin and Elizabeth both fought at Gettysburg against Pickett's charge. That's remarkable. She passed herself off as a man. And now I'm getting information about possibly two more Vermont women who may have done the same thing. The full truth will never be known about the women who fought disguised as men. The great nurse organizer Mary Livermore wrote, Some of the, someone has stated the number of women soldiers who served at less than 400. I am convinced a larger number disguised themselves and enlisted in the service for one cause or another than was dreamed of. Entrenched in secrecy and regarded as men, they were sometimes revealed as women by accident or casualty. Some startling histories of these women were current in the gossip of army life, and one always felt they had a foundation in fact. 
and speaking of Mary Livermore as we come to the end of this. After the war, many of the abolitionists, women and men, got involved in the women's suffrage movement, including Mary Livermore. On a winter day in 1870, a train steamed into the Montpelier station across the street from the State House, carrying a considerable number of women come to attend a meeting of the all-male Vermont Women's Suffrage Association. From the train step, Julia Ward Howe, author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, the unofficial anthem of the Union armies, written, of course, to the tune of John Brown's body. He has sounded forth the trumpets that shall never call retreat. And there's a lesser known verse that describes Christ. He is coming like the glory of the morning on the wave. Oh. As Miss Howe was getting her luggage, Julia Ward Howe, she looked down the station platform and saw none other than her old friend Mary Livermore, that great Civil War nurse. Union General William Tecumseh Sherman had once said of Livermore, she outranks me. These two women had seen much of the war, had helped shape its history through the four years of fire and fury. This day, how shouted to her old friend, Oh, you great big Livermore! <laughs> and she was big. And off they went down the platform, arm in arm, off to war again for another cause, like the Civil War having to do with equality. And they never ceased in the fight for women's right to vote, for suffrage, and of course, well after they were gone, American women finally won another victory for human rights. Such wars for the mighty causes go on and on. The trumpets must never call retreat. Thank you for listening.